very much, Elizabeth, and it's good to know that I can bookend it with trivia. <laughs> University research, who said it was getting uh, too arcane. Um, so I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to talk about basically four areas that I've researched in the 26 years that I've been in Australia. Um, with the zeal of the newcomer, and perhaps even the cheek of the outsider, I jumped in, boots and all, into uh, what I found a really fascinating aspect of Australian history from the moment I got here. So I'm going to talk about, um, you can see there, one of the topics is women in the Vietnam War. You can see a couple of army nurses there in Vietnam, and Ray Desmond in the right hand corner, um, who was an entertainer in Vietnam. I'll be talking about the migrants who worked on the Snowy Mountain scheme down in the bottom corner. They're sitting there waiting for an explosion to go off in the tunnel. I'll be playing you some of the voices of uh, some of the victims of the stolen uh, generation, generations uh, policy. And I'll be talking finally about that series that uh, Elizabeth mentioned, Marrying Out, which was about sectarianism and mixed marriage a topic that anybody under 50 will find really quaint uh, because it's about sectarianism between Catholics and Protestants and mixed marriage of that genre. But anybody over 50 will know exactly what I'm talking about. I can see heads nodding. And hopefully this will all come together around the idea of using voice and using oral history as a way of particularly connecting across generations and across community. So I'll start straight away with the, um, the Snowy Mountains scheme. Most of you will know uh, that it was built between 49 and 74. We've got somebody in the room who can recite the man from Snowy River. <laughs> you can ask for a performance later. Um, it's an iconic scheme, and I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail about the actual physical engineering side. I'm more interested in the social engineering side, because it was a miracle of social engineering as much as as, as a major engineering feat. So there were about 100,000 workers, and the interesting thing was that two-thirds of them came out from Europe just after the war. So how did these people manage to all pitch in and work together and overcome these national grievances that had so recently been, seen them in conflict? This was what interested me, particularly because in 1949, and these figures have come from biographer Charles Price, Australia was 90% of British and Irish origin. So the Snowy was the spawning ground of what would become multicultural Australia. And there were two kinds of migrants who came out to the Snowy. One, the, the displaced persons or refugees as we call them now. And the, the condition there was that they had to work for two years wherever they were sent on some government works. And interestingly, not one of the people I interviewed found that to be a problem. You know, they were quite happy with that as a condition of getting permanent residence. And then the later economic migrants. So my first clip is actually going to be about this significant decision to take displaced persons in from Europe, most of them coming from Eastern Europe to, uh, to get away from communism. Uh, the, 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 the Iron Curtain was in place after the war. And just to share a little personal insight onto this significant moment, here's a clip of an interview with a man called um, Sir Robert Jackson, who was the Australian Secretary of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration at the time. So he was in charge of trying to repatriate or relocate three million displaced persons. And he came out to see Ben Chifley, Prime Minister Chifley, who's in the picture there at the opening of the Snowy Scheme. And I'll just, it's a very short clip, I'll just let you hear how he describes that meeting. Well, I went with General Cannon, I saw him as, uh, he certainly was the most remarkable man. He never get his pipe to light. All the matches go over his shoulder uh, all the time. Oh, how many do you want us to take? And I said, well, sir, can you take 100,000? Why should we take 100,000? I said, the logic there is whoever gets the first 100,000 is going to get the absolute cream of the crop or whatever you like. He thought that was good logic. Then he said, oh, uh, hold on, there are not too many poles. We don't want a Buffalo City in Australia. So I said, no, we didn't take too many poles. There were plenty of bobs with us as well. Anyway, he said, we'll do it. Then he added, the boys, presumably that was the cabinet, wouldn't like it. But I'll convince Arthur, I think it was Mr. Cornwall, it will be done. 
So, the, uh, the policy documents don't quite record it in that manner. <laughs> and I can tell you that I had some difficulty. I did put that uh, interview um, quote into my book on the snowy, and I had some difficulty trying to work out how to spell matches one over his shoulder. So if anybody has any ideas, uh, I'd be glad to hear them. Uh, and some of the quality of these clips will vary, because some of them were done quite a long time ago on cassettes before we had excellent digital recorders. But as you can already hear, you're getting more than just the actual content, the word content, when you're listening to somebody's voice. You're getting a sense of personality, you're getting a sense of mood, you're getting information about their social and cultural background. And this is what I particularly love about voice, and I use it a lot. I take oral history and I treat it for radio documentary. And I also, there is a place for it, of course, as well, in print, I'll come to that. But I'm going to just play you now a few of uh, a little vox pop of the nationalities on the snowy. There were about 30, at least 30 nationalities, and I interviewed 25 of them. And uh, uh, maybe have a go at trying to identify where these people come from. I'll tell you after you hear them. So I asked people to describe how the nationalities got on, and they all had different views. The person who you will hear speaking at the end is Con Martinov who was a survey assistant. He was a white Russian, as they called him in those days, um, fleeing from Russia to escape communism. And he spent 23 years working on the snowy scheme, almost from the beginning to the end. And seven of those years, as he told me, straight in a tent. He didn't sleep anywhere but in a tent. And uh, you know, he, he really made, it. one of the migrants that made an amazing contribution. But here's a few of them talking about what it was like to be among that uh, there were quite a few tensions because it was not long after the Second World War finished, but somehow it didn't last. It may have been an argument, maybe even a fight, but people realized that it's not worthwhile carrying on those old troubles into a new country. I've never ever seen uh, a fight between any nationality. Yes. Often it's had a few yes. fights at all, I can <laughs> Wet canteen had a bit of a bunch of very few and far between. Well, I would say that probably the hardest person to get on with out in those early construction camps would have been the oldest person who was prepared to change. The country had been his, he'd worked at his own pace, uh, he resented people coming in and making more money than, than he was making, although he was retained all the people there. So everybody got a fair go, everybody was treated the same. The opportunity to make money, that's what we were there for. Look, you will find more trouble going down to Canada, probably than uh, all the trouble they have the Americans and all that. The Germans would call the Italian amigo, the Italian would call the German camaraten, whatever. That was all years in the army, that was all forgot. I could have hated those German chaps as much as anybody else, but I couldn't see the sense of that. We were there to do a job. It was made, the war's over, and they were there to keep all of that. It's bad luck, isn't it? And here's Khan. People wanted, don't think, to form or carve out a life for themselves in this new country, to have a goal. And from Bill Hudson, the commissioner, right there, it was a feeling that we are doing something worthwhile. So, who got it right? The first person, the woman, was any, 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 any ideas? Polish. Polish? You're getting over there, yeah? No. Um, actually, it was a country that when she arrived here, she said it didn't exist anymore. Croatia. No, moving over a bit um, to the west. Estonia. Ksenia <laughs> Nijelski. She spoke five languages. Um, and she was employed on the scheme who, as a personnel worker. Uh, then Paddy Kerrigan from Duddy Hall in Ireland, easy to spot. Then uh, the Australian plant operator, uh, an Italian miner, another Australian, and that was quite a poignant moment because he actually helped a German who was being set upon in the wet canteen. And I interviewed both of them, the German and, uh, and Tom. And Tom realized that you know the guys were just pushing an auto and they, they nudged him so that he dropped his, his plate and he went back and he got another plate and they did it again. This was 1951, not long after the war. And Tom's sense of fairness overcame that sense of 
you know, bloody Germans that was around at the time. And it was very touchy, because Otto had, in fact, been a, a, a champion boxer and could have easily decked the guy. <laughs> so there were all these things going on but beneath the scenes. In fact, Otto had been in the German army. When I asked him why he joined the army, he said, because I thought the food would be better than in the orphanage. <laughs> he had been an orphan. So, yeah, really lovely sort of uh, personal story. So, um, the, I won't go into it, even though the work is really important, I, I was more interested really in finding out and understanding the work in order to understand um, what roles the various workers and migrants played. Um, there are all the facts and figures, and I can tell you books are better for facts and figures. That's the one place where, you know, if you want to do an analysis, you go back to print. And, and indeed I did, there's a book there as well. But what I was interested in was from the stories I was being told, safety was a huge issue on the Snowy Mountain scheme. And it wasn't always, things weren't always carried out as they were hypothetically supposed to be, far from it. Uh, why was that? Well, because although there's a very strong safety culture in Australian mines that go back a long way, this was different. The wages were linked to speed, and people were earning three times the basic wage, and people were desperate to earn money. The union was very weak. The Australian Workers Union had six and a half to the seven thousand workers, but its secretary Charlie Oliver told me he couldn't be, he couldn't get a handle on these new migrants who didn't have a strong union tradition. He didn't understand. He didn't make any concessions for them being um, from different countries. He actually said to me, half of them couldn't. They spoke thirty languages. He said half of them couldn't understand each other anyhow, as if they should all speak one common language called Wog. <laughs> yeah, it was extraordinary. So. Um, Anyway, um, they, they also had contractors, and in the tunnels in the beginning they were mostly American contractors, and they were highly efficient, as you can see there, a three-tier jumbo rig that was used to, to drill. Um, the men would approach the tunnel, the rock face, and load the jelly night, and, and it was very efficient and, and slick. But they were, um, they were considered to be very hard taskmasters. Uh, but the men contributed to this because they were breaking world records in hard rock drilling and they loved the machismo of it and they would actually compete with each other, both along ethnic lines and, you know, Italians, northern Italians would fight the Ita southern Italians and, and then maybe another group would fight the, what they call then the Yugoslavs, the Serbs, the Shorts. By the way, they were the only groups that did continue on some of the um, hostilities on the snowy. Um, the other national tensions died down, but the Serbs and Croats kept up a certain um, amount, a low-level conflict, uh, pretty well right the way through. Now, there were 121 fatalities, so safety was a major issue, and 56 of those were underground. And I wanted to understand what was behind those fatalities. So here's a tunnel. There are brilliant stories that I probably won't go into maybe in a question time about the concreting and the dangers involved in concrete lining the tunnel um, and the hierarchy that obtained whereby Italians tended to do it. They tended to do most of the difficult, dirty work, partly because of their well-known affinity with concrete, and, uh, <laughs> but, but also it was a kind of a point of pride. But at the same time, like an Australian whom I interviewed, he walked out of the tunnel rather than do the concreting job because he knew how dangerous it was and he didn't have to have to stay there. He, he could afford to quit. Um, so the safety legend on the Tees thing is not entirely, um, um, you know, it's wishful thinking to some degree. They didn't even have a safety committee for 10 years in. The axiom in those days was a man a mile. Practically every mine I interviewed quoted that to me. A man a mile would die in the construction of those tunnels because it is dangerous work and things happen. Rocks fall out of, 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 uh, of the ceiling even if you have barred down efficiently. In fact, on a snowy, I mean, a man a mile at Mont Blanc, it was 1.4 men a mile in the tunnel in Switzerland. In San Bernard, three men a mile died. The snowy actually was relatively good. The grisly statistic when I worked it out was 0.6 of a man a mile, which of course is absurd, but that, that's what it comes down to proportionally. But I just want to play you here uh, some of the workers in the tunnels talking about how they operated. So here's an Irish first aid worker called Neil Gabor, who also wrote 50 songs about the scheme of telling themselves, a fantastic record. Eulip again, Pino Freitza, uh, who was uh, on the scheme in Italian, and Charlie Silvestro. And they're just talking about the work practices. When they finished the drill, 
And when they bounced, and they were new rock players going to do it again. So the mother said, 12 grand holes, 20 grand holes, so there's going to be a little bit left of the old green holes in the rock. So to get a quick start, what the miners just often do, they put their players into the old, what they call the pot holes. This could be very dangerous because sometimes, incredibly almost, after they fired the rock, some of the jelly mine would stay in, in the butt hole and not have gone off. You might have half a stick of jelly mine. So then when you put in the drill, bang bang, it should go off. The danger was there, but believe you me, they were looking for the big fat wedges. When you're young, you know. And believe you me, the Americans make sure that you work. Very, very tough people. Come on, come on. Come on, Joe. After you fire the time when you've got all of this rock, a lot of rocks up on top are sitting there waiting to fall on the head. So then they bar down with long steel bars. Now maybe they won't bar down as conscientiously as they should. Maybe the uh, ship boss will sort of hurry up and say, well, that's good enough. Although after a few bad accidents, they get pretty sick because it's quite a while. But then gradually, they lose that caution and start taking chances to get more luck out, get more money. Everybody was on bonus. I'd say a quarter of the pie was bonus. As far as I know, it was uh, go always. So, you know, they hardly stop for anything. So, um, I did go through the inquests, obviously, as well, and that's all documented in the book. But I think that gives you a sense of how they felt about the work and what they were really doing on the job, as opposed to what is you know, the officially reported so-called standards they were working to. And I did write, the, you know, a specific reference to two incidents that men died needlessly as a result of safety being sacrificed to speed, and nobody has sued me yet. So I think the Snowman Society does accept that they did have some responsibility in that regard. It wasn't them who were actually overseeing things, it was the contractors. So they weren't applying the standards that varied according to who the contractor was. But things did improve after 1959 when they had, uh, they instigated a safety committee and they started to take um, more steps. And in fact, they brought in seatbelts, that alone, uh, they were the first to bring in seatbelts in Australia. So I'm going to move from the snowy to the next topic, Australian women in the Vietnam War. And I did a radio series and a book about this because I discovered that about a thousand Australian women had been directly involved in the Vietnam War. And when I went to interview two nurses, and one of them is Trish, Trish Ferguson in the blue swimmers there, she's uh, an army nurse um, off duty at Vong Tau. And this, I thought, was such a surreal photo taken by her then husband, a UPI photographer. And her brother is one of the soldiers on the APC behind. And when we made a, uh, they were there in these capacities. These are the people I interviewed. And later, it was, it was actually made into a stage play that you may have seen here at IPAC. And Trish came to the opening in Sydney, and she brought with her the blue swimmers, those blue swimmers. <laughs> and even more astonishingly, she could still fit into them. <laughs> but um, when I started talking to the nurses, I realized they were speaking about the Vietnam War in an entirely different way. They were talking about personal issues, emotional stuff, they were talking about Vietnamese people as people. They weren't seeing the war as combatants because they weren't there in that capacity. And it informed, it gave a whole new perspective. They also talked a lot about the sexual politics and about race issues when they were in contact with American troops, where 1968, you know, the whole Black Power movement was taking off and it was hugely sensitive. First, for a little bit of light relief, because what I hadn't expected either was that there would be a lot of fun in the war. And you know, this is why wars always encompass the best and the worst. And this woman, Helen Keyes, was an extraordinary character, a total larrikin, who um, had left school early but was smart and had aspirations and went to Vietnam with uh, a one-way Pan Am ticket, a small bag, and $20. And had the time of her life, reveled in the odds, the fact that there were so few females, round-eyed females, <laughs> And, as, and she has the best line in the entire book, which uh, I'll leave you to, but I'll, I'll signal it. She says, I didn't like my own cigarette for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to pull one out and there'd be six zippos around. <laughs> so, but here she's talking, this is quite a funny piece, where she's talking about the extraordinary things she got up to, because she realized very quickly that she was being patronized. This was the women's movement was starting, it was 1968. 
but she twisted it to her own advantage and used that to get away with all kinds of stuff, as she will relate. And believe me, she was a very sound witness. She even had a little bit of the rocket under her bed, like in a, in a suitcase that had gone through her hooch. Everything she told me, she could corroborate with documented evidence. So here she is talking about how she sort of used the gender imbalance to her, um, to her advantage. I used to sign my own travel orders with a forged name. I used to use Benjamin M. Hance. H-A-N-C-E, acting lieutenant commander, and I'd sign B and Hans, and I'd type them myself and print them and go and get on planes and fly around the country to parties with my own travel orders, and I'd supply them to all my friends. And uh, I used to give several Vietnamese ones so that they could ship their, their friends around the country at American expense. Um, I learnt to thumb my nose at systems. When I went to Cameron Bay, I was given mess privileges and a mess card. And I was made an honorary member of the Billy Goats, which is the 559th Tactical Fighter Squadron. They were uh, Phantom Jet pilots. And they made me a Billy Goat suit, and that was one of those blue pilot suits. I mean, instead of having any rank on the shoulder, they put a female symbol. And I was dancing with a guy, and a general tried to butt in. And um, I said, I'll butter off, general, or something, to him. And he said, I'll oh, speak to you about that. And I said, I'll butter off again. <laughs> Go away, and he leered at my shoulder to see what rank I was, and it sunk in after a while. And he stood back and he snapped to attention and he saluted, and he said to me, I salute a higher rank, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Here she is now, talking about her dates. Fighting souls oh, this was a little bit of fun. The sky. Parody in it. It was a smorgasbord, it was wonderful. I had actually had six dates in one night once in my own night. I got to every one of them. <laughs> I didn't like my own cigarette for nearly two years. I only had four cigarettes out and there'd be six cigarettes around me. Guys used to beg us to talk to them or to sit at their table. They used to do things like lie on the ground in front of us and say, me, 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 and me. <laughs> it was just weird. <laughs> So, but obviously, you know, there were really dark sides. And here's another person, Elizabeth Burton, who's a Wollongong girl. And she was a hairdresser's apprentice and a go-go dancer on the side when she was offered the chance to go to Vietnam. And she thought, well, I'll never get overseas any other way. So off she went. And her story is very complex. She starts, that's her with her daughter there, and she starts off describing, you know, she was very naive, she didn't know anything about the war, and then she was asked to sign by the US Military Entertainment Commission as part of being an entertainer for those troops, a document saying she would mix with none other than Caucasians. And she refused because she didn't believe in that. And she got into terrible trouble as a result. She was eventually deported as a race riot risk but not, not before some terrible things had happened to her, partly as a result of her fraternizing. Uh, she was seen with blacks and whites at a time when the black power movement was very divisive. And, you know, people were dying. Um, the, the black GIs were, were robbing grenades into officers' tents and things like this were happening. In fact, one Australian entertainer died on stage. A, a fellow, a GI, shot, was trying to shoot his commanding officer and got her instead, Kathy Lawrence. She'd only been in the country for two weeks. So Elizabeth ended up um, trying to get away from that attention that was there, that Helen so reveled in, but that could be very oppressive and quite frightening. And she was gang raped by six American soldiers. Ironically and cruelly, three were white, three were black. And she describes it very, very candidly uh, because she's now a very proud woman who has reclaimed her past and she's a Buddhist and she's come to terms with it. She's now a professional stripper who teaches older women to strip and, you know, be proud uh, of their bodies. Um, so I'm not going to play the rape uh, story because it is, um, uh, you know, I have played it before um, and she's very, she's not at all embarrassed about it, but and it is very much part of the story. But I'm just going to play a different sub, sort of um, thing that she talks about, how she reckons that they stopped the war when they were performing. Yeah. Oops. Sometimes this happens, it doesn't. Sometimes you might do three shows in a day, 
So you were out there hitchhiking on aeroplanes and you worked different places. Like we went in helicopters one time and arrived where there was a bald hill, a steel girder, a generator and a tent. The boys in the band set up the equipment. We got in the tent and got dressed and we came out of the tent and there were just thousands of guys on tanks and trucks and the bald hill was just like a mass of people now. And they said that we stopped the war that the uh, Viet Cong were in the trees at the bottom of the hill watching the show, which is pleased me. <laughs> Kicks. I had to finish that, give her that punchline and that was music. And music was very much part of the social history of the time, as you know, so I had a bit of fun with that. Especially because in that program there was an awful lot of darkness. And obviously when you had the lighter moments, you wanted people to be able to recover, if you like. And you can't just give people a whole diet of trauma. It, you, get, you actually get a sort of compassion fatigue trying to take it in. But this next piece is a very harrowing piece. Jan Graham was a journalist in Vietnam for 10 years. And I'm going to do a comparison here of the voice, the audio, with the text. Because her audio, I find really compelling and affecting. And I will go into a little bit of theory after this about why that might be. But I could never approximate it on the page. So I'm going to let you judge for yourselves. Um, I had different versions. The audio version was in the radio series on the ABC. Then I wrote what I call a journalistic version in the first edition of the book in 93. Then I tried to do it in a different way, in a sort of a poetic spacing to try and recapture the cadences of the voice. And we even had a theatrical version where a very good actor spoke her words. But in my view, the one that actually, and I've written an essay about this online, but the, the one that absolutely is, has no parallel, is her speaking in her own words about what happened. Terrible things happened to Jan over the period of 10 years. And she was dubious about speaking to me. I had put a man in the Sydney Morning Herald, and she brought me, and then she, she cancelled out, and then she ran and said, no, I want to do it, I want to do it. So even when I offered to stop the tape, she insisted on continuing. And she's, you know, I've had contact with her regularly since, and she was fine with it. But this is describing an incident which happened to her where she was kind of like embedded, the way we say now, with an American patrol, and they'd been out the night before, this guy was going home, and they were literally on his way to the airport to go home to, to be with his wife, when something happened. Now, strong language warning, which I almost forgot to say in the ABC, and was in terrible trouble. Um, but I think you can cope with it. He's done his tour of duty, he's been getting plastered with everybody else in the camp. And we were taking him down to the airstrip. And he saw something going on in the field. And he jumped out. He should have stayed in a fucking jeep. And he ran in. And there was a big explosion. I did the most stupid thing of my life. I ran in after him. And his legs were blown off. His pants and testicles were gone. And he was just bleeding, so I think I could do. So I cradled what was left of his body, torso and head, and cuddled him. And he thought I was his wife, who he was going home to see, to be with for the rest of his life. And he spoke to me of how much he loved me, how happy he was to be home, how wonderful it was to be in a her arms again, my arms. I have missed this for 12 months. I haven't looked at another woman I have loved you so much. And I told him how much I loved him. It was so wonderful he was home. For me 15 minutes to die, I was told. It seemed like five, six hours. Didn't you say that you found out you let him tell his wife. Yes, I did. And she told me she was so proud. So proud to know me. She hated me. She said, at least he died with somebody who loved him. Is it no? She said, yes, he did, because you were me. 
side of me, you should have been telling her. But she said she could understand it more than myself. To her, he was telling her. She cried, she said, this is the first tears of joy I have had since then. So, very, very affecting. And the sort of thing, we don't, it must happen so often, these kind of terrible moments of taking, sharing somebody's death. And one of the nurses said, you know, that sharing of somebody's death is more intimate than sex or childbirth. It is the most intimate thing that there is. And yet, when I tried to write it, and I can see that many of you are very moved by it, and when I tried to write it in the book, it just didn't have, the words just seemed really flat on the page. I mean, you're probably hearing her voice echoing in your mind, but imagine if you just picked up a book and didn't, had never heard the emotion in her voice. The words just don't get it, you know? I tried to describe it, but it's not there, and it haunted me. So when I got a chance to do a rewrite, uh, another edition, I did it this way. And I think that does approximate more to the actual feeling of what, you know, the, the emphases and the tone. But I still, for my money, um, I mean, I think if I did a poll, I think I have asked, whenever I have asked anybody about this, people have always felt that the audio is by far the stronger version. And uh, I think that this is an example of, uh, an absolute classic example of the power of voice. So why is it that we get so affected? And most people would probably say the emotion in her voice. Well, neuroscientists have come up with a kind of, a, an attempt to physiologically understand what's going on here. And I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but just in case you are interested, I thought I'd give you some background on who the main theorists are. Uh, Schaus is an American cultural studies theorist who defines affect as a non-conscious experience of intensity, a moment of unformed and unstructured potential. And he talks about the fact that actually we, you are having an affective resonance with the speaker there, which may very well have more import and be of more significance than the actual content that you're hearing. You know, you're reacting to what you're detecting in the voice, which they're interrelated, the notions of, of feelings, emotions, and affect, but he differentiates between them in this way. And people are starting, I mean, you could look at it in a different way, when you go to a live performance as compared to when you, when you, uh, you listen to music on a CD that's not live. You're picking up again on the effective resonance in the positive way in that sense at a live performance. Orators can use affect as well. So it's a very interesting area of study. Um, I'm going to play another example that would show you in a less dramatic way, but I still think an interesting way, uh, the power of voice and how we can hear mood and emotion and that that in itself signifies something beyond the words themselves. And this is from a woman called Phyllis. And I should say, just in case there are indigenous people present, that you know, they may find it disturbing because a couple of these people have passed away. So just to be advised of that. Um, Phyllis was a woman I was invited to interview by her son up in Broome when I was visiting for another purpose. And I actually said to him, he, said, he kept saying to me, oh, you know, she was reared by these Irish nuns. And I said, I said, all oh, right, and I sort of moved on with my story, what I was doing. And he kept persisting, and I finally said, rather bluntly, I said, look, Mark, I said, I actually left Ireland largely to get away from Irish nuns. <laughs> and he said, no, no, these ones were good ones, good ones, you know. So off I went, a bit mystified, and Phyllis told me her story. And once she told me her story, somebody, she put me on to somebody else, to somebody else, to the nuns, and it became a very complex story, which went to where just before the walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge in 2000. And it was actually a pivotal time. And I'll talk about the impact in a minute. Just, this is only 28 seconds. Phyllis, uh, Phyllis was taken away from her mother because she was, in those days there was a policy where Aborigines of mixed race were removed for decades, right into the 1970s. It was official policy, and her father had been a white man who uh, had sexually used, is the way it was put to me, her mother. Um, and when she was three, Phyllis had a fever, and her mother took her to Derby Hospital. And when she was in there, the hospital passed her out the back to the authorities, who passed her on to the nuns, 
who reared her in Beagle Bay in the orphanage. Now, she did actually have a lot of good things to say about those nuns who, who didn't conform to the stereotype of the really cruel, deculturating kind of people that some institutions provided. But the point was, she didn't see her mother again until she was 17, working as a domestic uh, cleaning in a hospital. And she was just told she had a visitor. And I just wanted to listen to the, just the melancholy in the, in the voice. It just happened that my mother came once to see me, but she was hurt, I could understand. She was upset. I mean, taking her child away at a small age and then going back to see the mother as an adult, well, she would be shocked, I suppose, thinking, oh, you're not my daughter. But that was the first and the last I've seen her. So she's saying she only saw her mother once and her mother rejected her, like could not accept that this was actually her daughter because she couldn't uh, reconcile this with the little toddler that she'd lost. And I just feel again, if you look at the words, you don't quite get it. You know, there's such an undertow of sadness in her voice. And when those voices went to air, people wrote into the ABC and said, now we get it. We never heard the personal pain before. All, all we heard were academics and um, politicians discussing this as policy. Now we understand. And I played this for traveler women in Ireland, and I didn't think they'd get the context, you know, women from the desert, you know, these people that never, they were in the minority in Ireland. All they said was that poor woman losing her child. They could hear it, it's universal. So trying to understand the power of voice Sandro Portelli is a very well-regarded Italian or historian who says that working on a transcript rather than tape is equivalent to doing art criticism on reproductions. And he points out that, you know, print can flatten the emotional content. And this supposed privileging of documents as if they are somehow innately more objective and have more respectability. Whereas, in fact, you're actually losing elements and you're losing accuracy in one sense by doing this, because a transcript is an arbitrary interpretation anyway. Um, so this is a fascinating area that I could talk forever about, but I just want to move on to, to Daisy, because I think I only have time for about another couple of clips, maybe two or three. Um, Daisy was a friend of Phyllis, reared in the same orphanage, and um, these are quotes from the Bring Them Home report, um, some background for you, the sorry little sky written at the time of that walk, and this is Daisy, who was taken also at the age of about two, and this is a slightly longer clip, it's about two minutes, because it talks about how much she gained and how much she lost, and in particular, her loss of culture. And when I was interviewing her, there was a little, her little grandchild was there, and it sounds amazingly like, to me, symbolically, almost the little girl you can hear in the background is like representing the Daisy who was taken away. She's just a light-hearted little girl singing away. So this is Daisy. I can't remember my mother. I was taken from her when I was about two, two or three. I'm just going by my welfare papers now what I got. Well, I haven't seen my mother again, never again. In 68 or 9, I went back up there. That's when I see my sister for the first time in the whole street. And uh, we really shy to for each other, you know, so not close in a way, you know. When they took me, I was, I could speak my language, but uh, we just lost it with there's no one to talk to and keep up our culture and everything. We just lost everything. That's what I'm really sorry about, you know. When I see little kids my uh, that age now, talking and things, I just always think back for what, you know, what I used to like what I lost, you know. And feel really sad about it. So when you went to Beagle Bay, um, what was it like being brought up by the nuns as a child? Can you remember how you felt? They really made us feel that we were part of a family, you know. And we felt really good. I'm still lonely and. Sometimes I can really remember crying to sleep, crying myself to sleep, you know, just, but then we got on really well with everyone, you know, we just, we loved the nuns. And so when you go back to where you were originally from, do you still feel a sense of connection to that country? I do, yeah. 
And I felt like, yeah, I just, you know, I still feel it. I cry too. I went a few times with the people from the language center. I mean, I just pick up a few words here and there. Like, my Aboriginal name, Janelli is my Aboriginal name. One of them just saying to me, come back home. And I just think to myself, where's home, you know? I mean, I know home is there, but I, I'm sort of between two cultures or what. I would really love to live in the bush, but my own, you know, with my mother. But now, you know, we, we're going to live this life now. And the only way we live, we never know. We don't know the other. Again, you can hear the sort of poignant tone in, in her voice and the amount of loss that there is there. And when I played that at Harvard, the Native Americans who were there um, found really strong resonances with, um, with their own experiences. I'm, I'm going to just whip through a few things now just to kind of come to the end. This is the last thing I was going to talk about, which was my series on sectarianism, which is rather, rather involved. I'm not going to have much time to get into the old chestnut arguments about whether oral history is, um, we could talk about it maybe in questions, but the cat was set among the pigeons in 1949 by Patrick O'Farrell when he was put, put this in a review that, you know, oral history was just about kind of selective memory overlays and other subjectivity. And I'll tell you later about the feud I had with Patrick O'Farrell, which happily was reconciled before he died. But um, his position was refuted ably by Portelli, who actually said, yes, of course it's subjective, and that's its strength. It's not a weakness. You've got to see subjectivity as a strength. Because, I love this quote, to ignore and exercise subjectivity as if it were only a noxious interference in the pure data. So as if, as if you know, document historians aren't also being subjective in what they select to use and how they juxtapose it. Um, and Porgelli then went in with another thing. He said, of course memory is, is uh, malleable. It's an ongoing work. Very elegant writer, Porgelli, if you're interested in art history, I recommend him. So, um, I'll, I'll just play you one bit from this. Uh, this was about sectarianism between this couple. He was cut out of three wills uh, for, uh, as a Protestant for marrying Helen, a Catholic. And um, really sad, you know, it, it, the Irish, it wasn't about religion so much as about politics. The religion in those days was, was code for culture. And essentially, up until the 1950s, Irish meant Catholic. And, Catholic was perceived as Irish, even though there were 20% Irish Protestants. So I'll just play you a little bit of the opening um, montage there of, uh, of this program, which are a few Catholic uh, interviewees. I did try to be even-handed, um, although I certainly didn't try to be subjective. And uh, I, um, I, this is the Catholic viewpoint, and I have included things like music, and this is a kind of creative treatment of the voice, so as to look for an artistic interpretation, really, which I'm quite happy to defend. Some, some purist art historians get concerned with the very notion even of editing, um, but um, I'm, I'm locked in argument around that at the moment with people on a list. But here's the opening, here's the opening montage. Oops, back. Come on. My mother came from a strict Methodist family and they were absolutely horrified to think that she was marrying a Catholic because of people's perception of Catholicism in those days. We were a second class citizens. One line the employment columns was printed in heavier black print than the remainder of the article, and it read, Catholics need not apply. Bog Irish, lazy, drunken, dirty Irish. It was 65 or 66 when I went to school. I'd often get spatulas as I came home and that Catholic dog, Catholic dog thing. A Catholic dog sitting on a log, eating maggots out of a frog. When my mother died, her brother sent me a sympathy card and all he wrote on it was dear gay. There's one thing I remember about your mother. She married a Catholic. And I thought, oh, I'll never speak to you again. I ripped up the card. I thought, how dare you say that to me in my grief? My husband's 
grandmother had very strong views about Catholics. It didn't really matter to her that I was a very lapsed Catholic or I wasn't a seriously practicing Catholic. It was that I, I represented something that she really found hard to cope with. Catholics were other in all the ways you could be other. So this is really our history as, you know, reclaiming a part of history that had begun to be rewritten. And I had realized that, to my horror, that this was being forgotten. The Catholics had, for about 180 years, been the underclass in Australia. And their struggle to be accepted had paved the way for subsequent groups to be able to claim their place. But now, suddenly, in the last kind of five, ten years, people had started talking about the Anglo-Celtic Anglo-Celtic Australia, which is fine as a demographic term, but not as a cultural descriptor. And it was being used to imply the kind of, it was like a polite version of white Australia. And it, it implied that, you know, there was a core harmonious white settler stock comprised of uh, British and Irish, when it was quite the opposite as these oral histories show. And so this was quite a complex series and the oral histories are actually in the National Library. Um, for scrutiny and for further research. Because some people couldn't believe it that things were like this, but I felt a personal need to put this, uh, um, to go uh, on the record with this. And I did it through these stories, and I'm going to finish with this clip, and I'll talk just then about the relevance of that today, because the labels that were applied to Catholics then, when you actually look at them, Senator John Faulkner pointed this out in the Senate, they were pretty well the same as were applied to Lebanese Muslims at Cronulla you know, disloyal, other, um, different religion, couldn't be trusted, it's seditious, all of those ti titles were applied. So this is the meaning of oral history, that you can actually use it to, uh, to, to interpret today's situation. So the last clip is just um, the children who grew up in these mixed marriages trying to navigate a middle way, and terrible stories, um, Susan Timmons, mother, they were quite wealthy Catholics, and they hated the Protestants because they had been driven off their land in the famine in Ireland, and they equated Protestant with English, with oppressor, with colonial oppressor. So when she eloped with um, Errol, she was never allowed back across the threshold, and she was barred from, when she went back to see her father who was dying, her mother barred her uh, from coming across the threshold. Her name was never mentioned in the family. And then she died in childbirth, give, giving birth to Susan's brother, and Susan was two. And I interviewed Susan as a woman in her 60s, a very sophisticated woman, and uh, she was telling me about how 40 years on, one of the mother's family got in touch with her father, who was a very compassionate man, and set up a meeting. And then here's Susan, and this is also just affecting the power of voice, describing what happens. And my father arranged, we all went out to dinner together, wouldn't this be a lovely bonding thing? Well, you can't take somebody who's had no contact with their mother's family for 30 or 40 years and then take you all out to dinner and expect that we would all be hunky-dory. I was hunky-dory enough in polite situation uh, until I'd had a few drinks and I suppose I then had to ask the question, just why? I said, you have to forgive me, but I'm antagonistic towards my mother's family. It's all right for you to swan in from overseas and say hi to my father, but did you ever care about what happened to us children? Did you ever care what happened to us kids? Did you ever care that my father was in such a dire situation that he had to put his children into an orphanage? He described that... Sorry. God, was this ridiculous? I'm 65. <laughs> he always described that as being the most terrible, terrible time of his life. He said, the man and up and his wife died, but two children in an orphanage because he couldn't support them. Uh, it was after the war, the widows were getting their uh, widows' pensions and things, but he got nothing. And Susan is quite fine with me using that. She's actually, you know, wants an open slather, used, uh, you know, copyright free, because she wants people to know the pain that sectarianism caused. And she ended up, herself and her husband, she went on to marry uh, a Catholic after being raised Anglican, much to her father's horror. And then they both gave away religion and they have two very secular children. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I've mentioned the, the implications of, uh, of, of this work 
today. I was very pleased when the series was picked up by an anti-racism site um, in 2010, and they, they were suggesting young people, I don't know who they were, that they listened to this and realized that Australia had this um, previous kind of racist or sectarian background. Um, that's why we keep doing it. And last clip, I had the most extraordinary example of the power of voice, which eclipses anything I've done, but sh certainly shows the power of voice. Just a week ago in Chicago at the uh, Third Coast Audio Radio Festival, this documentary made by Radio Lab, very famous program, Jad Abumrad. And um, this girl, Emily, is a, a, an art student um, in New York, and she was 21, went off on her bike one day to go to college and was run over by a truck and was absolutely just, you know, unbelievably uh, left in a coma, on life support, um, very fragile, tiny creature. And her mother had actually given the decision to turn off the life support. And, and then they noticed some kind of possible signs of something. And her, 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 her boyfriend, Alan, never gave up. And he hit on the idea of writing on her palm, a la what Annie Sullivan did with Helen Keller. So she had signs of life, and she had actually, he, she was able to respond to it when he wrote, but she spoke in a robotic way, and she didn't seem to know who he was, who she was, where she was. Um, so she had become blind in the accident, and is still blind. But what happened was, she had lost her hearing before the accident and used to wear hearing aids, but wouldn't let them put them in. She was fighting and scratching when she was coming out of this coma. So he asked, he said, you know, hearing aid okay? He wrote on her palm. And she said, she spoke in her robot voice, yes. So he puts in the hearing aid and he recorded this live on his mobile phone, which we can hear in this program, because he was trying to convince the authorities that she would be a good candidate for rehab. They were going to take her off to a nursing home instead. They didn't think she could cope with rehab. And he just says on the, on the tape, I haven't got the clip here, you can find it by Googling it, it's a 20 minute documentary. He says, I don't want to just sort of, you can't just sound like this stuff, you have to listen to the whole story. And he says, Emily, it's Alan, I love you. And there's just this crackly hiss, and then she just comes back virtually from wherever place she was, and she says, Alan, where am I? Where are you? And she starts, she completely regains cognizance. And it is an extraordinary story. It's been written up in the New York Times. And I was there in Chicago, and that girl was one seat ahead of me um, with Alan. And that, I contend, is an absolute, just no-brainer for the power of voice. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. there is much more intrusiveness in terms of not just the person being filmed, but the fact that, you know, people focus then on the face and they, 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 they get caught up with uh, little facial kind of ticks and imperfections or, you know, you get... Television people report this all the time. Several television news people have defected back to radio because they said they never went beyond the pictures. They couldn't even hear what I was saying. They always just went first for appearance. So first of all, you get hijacked by appearance when, when you're, uh, it's a distraction. And two, I, I did discuss this with um, Colin McNaughton, who's a very uh, well-regarded Australian um, documentary maker, and he's made 
films and radio documentaries, sorry, about the uh, Guatemalan uh, massacre uh, that occurred not long ago. And he talks about interviewing a woman whose daughter was found liquidized in a barrel, like her 13 or 14 year old daughter. And the only way they actually identified her was through her milk teeth. There was one that was still there. And he just said that it would be white, it would be porn for white people to stick a camera in front of that woman's face and ask her to tell that story again. Whereas somehow, it's like, you know, I'm the guy behind the camera. There's something that sort of objectifies you when you're sort of filming through a camera. Whereas the microphone, you actually do forget it. You're just going on eye contact and you're just talking. And somehow the voice, the intimacy, and the, it is there more strongly. I do think there are times when it works. Um, and certainly as a news medium, obviously, it has, it has its strengths. And people can use it very, very uh, sensitively. I mean, I, I'm a fan of Ken Burns, for instance. You know, although he's getting a bit, his techniques are getting a bit tired now. We should change them. But, uh, but I do love the cinema more. So yeah, I, I think there is a place where I would go 90%, I'd go for all the time. Any other questions? Yeah. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Yeah. Oh, it's not my thing. I think a lot of it would have to depend on the interviewer because uh, an inexperience, you've, you've been doing it for years, and I think you know how to ask the right questions. For example, my father was great on global history in Sydney, in Bankstown, and he interviewed all these people about Bankstown, and it was the most boring crap I have ever <laughs> gone through, and I just couldn't plough through it. It was shocking. And I've just, I've just put them in a box and I've left them for my daughters to go through when I'm dead because I don't think I could stand it. Yeah. Well, there is a technique to, I mean, I, you know, in the early years and still to a large extent, I mean, I tell my students the biggest secret, I call it the aerobic art of interviewing, because the biggest secret to getting um, a good relationship in an interview is actually intense listening you know, curiosity, interest. People can feel it, it's palpable. And, you know, you can, they can forgive you a lot. Lack of research, godlessness, naivety, <laughs> everything can be forgiven if you're actually interested and listening in, with laser-like intensity. So that, you know, you're processing what you're hearing and you're listening for things that need to be followed up. But that is a privilege most people don't get. A two hours of intensely being listened to and allowed to kind of narrate their story. And, and it's a simple thing, it works 90% of the time. But there is a discussion going on in the list where, you know, um, I mean, people do digress. You know, you get the Russian doll type person who starts saying something, you know, I, uh, I, um, you ask a question and they say, well, that was when I was in um, Belfast. Oh, Belfast's a nice town, it's not too far from Dublin. Dublin is great, by the way. Have you ever been there in a theatre festival? Oh, I love theatre. And they've gone miles away from where you started. Now, to me, that is what I would call a long, irrelevant aside. And that has come up as a question on the oral history list. And serious academics are discussing this as we speak. And people have said there is no such thing as a long, irrelevant aside. You know, a student said, how do I deal gracefully with a long, irrelevant aside? And all these people are writing back and saying, there's no such thing, you have to just find the meaning. There is meaning in everything uh, that is spoken. Now, in one sense, all autobiographical memory is true, and I, I understand that, and that's one position. But I find it absurd. If I'm interviewing a coal miner in Wollongong about coal mining, and the cat walks across the floor, and he says, oh, that cat had mange last week, and the cat down the road had mange, and he had allergies two years ago, and blah, blah, blah. This is not going to illuminate the history of coal mining. So what I suggested, and this was considered heresy, I suggest that you press pause on the actual order <laughs> and let the person, don't be rude, let him talk and be polite and listen, but you do not need to record the allergies of the cat for posterity. Um, you know, sometimes a bit of common sense is needed. And people have been emailing me privately and saying, thank you, thank you, but nobody's going to say that that's fair enough. <laughs> anyway, yeah.